In this video today, we're going to focus on what is a TFSA exactly, who can own a TFSA, how much money you can put in or contribute to a tax-free savings account, what investments can you buy? There's a lot of misconceptions out there. What happens if a TFSA holder passes away? Mistakes and misconceptions, misunderstandings. And finally, we're going to finish off with some strategies that you can use to make sure that you're getting uh, the biggest bang for your buck in your tax-free savings account. We are more than a decade now since the tax-free savings account or the TFSA was unveiled here in Canada. And even though all that time has gone by, there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what a tax-free savings account is, how you can put it to use, and uh, you know what are the most effective ways of using that for your to your advantages. In this video today, we're going to explore all of the aspects that will help you use this tool to the best of your own advantage. I think in order to understand uh, how the plan works and all the ins and outs of it, a little bit of context is, is in order. And I'm going to start with a brief history of the plan. The plan was unveiled back in 2009 by Jim Flaherty, who was the Conservative Minister of Finance back in the day. When it came out, there was a lot of misunderstanding of how it worked. However, the C.D. Howe Institute said back at the time, this tax policy gem is very good news for Canadians and Mr. Flaherty and his government deserve credit for a novel program. At the time, a lot of the large uh, groups, large business groups like the Chambers of Commerce, etc., really supported this type of plan as something that we could build on to create extra wealth for Canadians as time goes by. Let's look at exactly what a TFSA is. First and foremost, the number one thing you need to understand about a tax-free savings account is that it is an account. Now that might sound pretty obvious. However, a lot of people still are under the impression that a TFSA is an investment and not an account in and of itself. Think of it as a jar or a bucket uh, as a holder and you put certain investments in there. A major feature of the TFSA is that growth inside the plan is tax-free. And that's uh, like an RRSP where you put money in and it grows tax-free over the years. A big differentiating factor from a TFSA, however, is in a TF or from an RRSP is when you take money out of a TFSA, you don't pay tax on it. So a lot of Canadians are familiar with RRSPs. When you put money in, you get a tax deduction. When you take money out, you include that income uh, that uh, income on your income tax return and you pay tax at that point. A TFSA is almost the opposite. You put after-tax dollars in to the plan, it grows tax-free, and whenever you withdraw that money, you do not pay tax on it there. So they're kind of at the opposite ends of the spectrum there. Both are very valuable depending on your purposes. Uh, when you put money into the plan, as I mentioned, it's not tax deductible. There is no... Um, income tie to TFSAs. Unlike an RRSP, which is um, the contribution room is based on your income in a tax-free savings account, whether you have no income or whether you earn a million dollars a year, there are annual limits that the government puts on, and we'll cover those off in a few minutes here, but everybody, uh, every Canadian 18 years or older has the uh, ability, has the, the uh, option of contributing to an RRSP. Again, that differentiates it quite a bit from an RRSP, one other difference I will note as well is a TFSA is not protected against creditors. Let's talk now about who can have a TFSA in the first place. A few pieces of criteria. Number one, you have to be an individual. Companies can't have TFSAs, it's for individuals. You have to be a resident of Canada, you have to have a valid social insurance number, and you have to be 18 years or older. Quick note, in some provinces, the age of majority is 19. So you can't actually open an investment account until you're 19 uh, years of age. If you live in one of those provinces, you still are eligible for a TFSA at age 18. And uh, although you can't open the account till age 19, you do accrue that year's worth uh, of room. So you're not losing out on the actual dollar amount, but you are losing out on the time that you would have that account available to be invested in. Uh, a couple of other features. Number one is there is no upper age limit on a TFSA. Lastly, there are very special rules that apply to non-residents of Canada. So citizens of Canada who are living abroad, I'm going to cover those off in more detail a little bit later in this video. Let's talk about contributions to the TFSA because this is an area that is, um, there's a lot of confusion and I'm going to try and sort of clear that up for everybody here today. The contribution room is calculated by the following formula. You use the TFSA dollar limit of the current year, plus any unused TFSA contribution room from previous years, plus 
any withdrawals made from the TFSA in the previous year. We're going to get into some examples of what this actually means, uh, but that's that's the formula that you use that uh, you use to determine how much you actually can contribute to the TFSA. Now, when the program was launched, the maximum for that year was set at five thousand dollars. There is an indexing feature of the TFSA contribution room or the amount, and every year it is indexed to inflation. Now. It doesn't change every year. The way it works is as inflation increases the amount, there is a there is a, a buildup or there's an accrual of that room. When it reaches five hundred dollars, that is now added to the to the next year. And we're going to see if we look at this this chart or this table on the screen here, we're going to see that uh, again in two thousand nine the limit was five thousand dollars, and in fact that amount stayed consistent through to two thousand and twelve. In twenty thirteen that uh, inflation or the CPI feature kicked in and the amount was raised to two, uh, to 5,500 and it remained the same through 2014. Now you'll notice on this table a real anomaly in 2015 and the, the final budget before the general election in that year, the conservative government raised the limit to $10,000. Now I'm, I'm certain there was some political uh, reasoning to do that and they so you'll you'll notice in that year in uh, 2015 there is a ten thousand dollar contribution limit for that year well the liberals won that election and they smacked that right back down to 5500 in the following year and it remained there for 2016 2017 2018 and then again the inflation factor kicked in and in 2019 20 and 21 the contribution number has been six thousand dollars uh ever since then what this means in summary here is that if you were if you were 18 years or older in 2009 and you have never contributed to the tax-free savings account because that room is carried forward every year, you could contribute $75,500 today in 2021. Now, if you weren't 18 or older back in 2009, there's some math that you have to do to calculate uh, how much you're eligible to contribute. Now I have prepared a table here that will help you in that endeavor. And down the left column, if you look at your birth year, it will say a couple of things. It'll say the year that you turned 18, the age that you are in 2021, and the, the according uh, amount that you're able to contribute as a lump sum if you've never contributed before. Let's just use the year 2000 as an example. If you were born in the year 2000, you turned 18 in the year 2018, and of course this year, 2021, you're 21 years old. You would have an accumulated amount of $23,500 that if you have never contributed before, you can use that now. Important to note though, is that growth within the plan is not counted as a contribution. It's only money that you actually put into the plan. So as a quick example, if you turned 18 this year and you're eligible to put your $6,000 in, let's say you did that, that 6,000 has now become $7,000. Your room isn't affected by the $1,000 growth in the plan. It would always be uh, related back to the $6,000 that you put in. Another note as well is uh, losses within your plan don't count as withdrawals or it doesn't adjust the amount. Same philosophy, if you put $6,000 in and then let's say you bought one of those fantastic meme stocks right at the peak and it's now worth $1,000, well, that $5,000 loss that you took on that isn't going to create additional room. It's all happening within that jar or within that bucket we talked about earlier. And so um, you just have to look at the actual number of, the, of contributions that you made to the plan to determine what your room is. It's not always easy to determine exactly what your room is uh, to, to put in the plan, but there are a few ways that, that you, know, you can get help in doing that. Number one, um, CRA has an account that a lot of people have signed up for now called My CRA for Individuals. And you can go on there and it will show you with uh, some degree of accuracy, not 100% though, uh, what your room would be. And it will show you the history of your tax-free savings uh, contributions. When I say it's not 100% accurate because it does take some time early in the year to have those numbers updated because they're waiting for information from the various investment companies that feed it to them. And so uh, use that as one of the methods to determine, but always compare that with your own numbers. Uh, they, CRA does have a mobile app that also will provide that same information. If you work with an accountant and you have an authorized representative, that person can also get the information and provide it to you directly from CRA. Uh, and there's a, there's a, um, uh, 1 800 number, 1 800, uh, tip, it's a tips line. Uh, the number I'll put on the screen here, 1 800 267 6999. And they also uh, will be able to provide you with the most up to date information as to what room you have. 
The best way of doing this, I think, as the first go-to, is to keep track of it yourself. And it is complicated. In order to help you out, uh, we've created a, a worksheet that will give you sort of a, if you put the accurate history in, it'll tell you what the room is. And I think we've got it designed for another 10 years or so, it'll go out. So you can put right back from 2009, up till today, and then uh, you, that will serve you uh, in years ahead as well. If you accurately enter the information, uh, feel free. I'll put a link in the video down below, and you can use that to help you uh, keep track of your contribution room as well. So once you know what that number is, the next step is you got to get started and actually open up a tax-free savings account and get some money into it. There are three official types of accounts that you can open. You can open a deposit account. You can open up an annuity contract or you can open up an, what's called an arrangement in trust. And it's kind of a fancy name, but basically what that means is you're going to open an account with uh, a bank, an investment company, with Quest Trade, for example, and put your money inside there. It's a trust arrangement. The facilities where you can do this or the institutions, you can do it at a bank, like I say. Insurance companies will offer this. Credit unions, um, trust companies investment dealers, all of these places where you would normally go, for example, to uh, open up an RRSP, they will be able to open up a tax-free savings account for you as well. So once you've got your account opened up, the next step would be to actually contribute some money to the fund. So this would be your first contributions within the limit that you're, uh, that you're restricted to there, and then make some investment decisions as to what you're gonna do with the money in there. I will note that there's also the ability to do what are called transfers or more specifically in-kind transfers. And this would be applicable if, uh, for example, you had another investment account right now and you wanted to just move some money. So let's say you had shares of Royal Bank in an investment account and you felt you would rather use that money inside of your tax-free savings account. You can take the money from uh, your non-registered account and transfer it into your TFSA and you will get credit for the dollar amount. Now, the, the, the amount that you get credit for contribution is the fair market value on the day that the money is actually received or posted to the uh, tax-free savings account. Important to note though, um, there are a couple of things. If, if the amount you're, you're transferring has gone up in value, that will be a, uh, a taxable event or what's called a deemed disposition. So let's assume you put $5,000 in shares of a company, it went up to say $6,000, and you transfer the full $6,000 in, that will trigger a $1,000 capital gain that you will be liable for, even though you haven't really necessarily sold those shares, but um, it will go in and you'll have to pay that gain in your, in your tax uh, preparation for that year. Conversely, if you put $5,000 into Royal Bank and it went down to $4,000, if you simply do a transfer into your TFSA, you won't get credit for that capital loss. And that's really important to understand that. Generally, if you have a gain and a loss, they can offset each other in a non-registered account. But in a case where you do a transfer, you don't get credit for the loss. So be uh, be wary of that or be aware of that. And a, a solution would be if this is if it makes sense for you to do that, tra that transfer is to um, sell anything that's at a loss first and then move the cash into the account, then you will be able to uh, actually, you know, you've liquidated that investment before the transfer. So you will get credit for a capital loss on that. It doesn't make any difference on the gains, whether you sell it first or whether you transfer it directly, um, you will uh, be liable for taxes on that regardless. Another transfer type that you can do is you can transfer from an existing RRSP or a RIF. Uh, into your TFSA, it will count as a withdrawal. So you have to be aware that, of that. You can't just take money from a registered account and move it into this into your tax-free savings account without any tax implications on that. But there may be occasions, there may be circumstances, and I'll talk about those more a little bit in the video, um, about that where that may make sense to do that. Again, the fair market value of the asset that is transferred in uh, on, when it's received is what is going to be counted as your contribution to your TFSA. So once you have your cash in your TFSA, what can you do with it? What types of investments are uh, available? And again, another real big area of confusion here. Although over the years, people are getting a little bit more uh, and more savvy as to what the options are within a tax-free savings account. I'll generalize and say that the investments that you can have inside of a TFSA are very similar maybe exact, are very, very similar to what you can have in an RRSP. Examples of those are uh, just put straight cash. You can have uh, GICs, term deposits, 
most securities, so stocks that are listed on a designated exchange, um, can be used inside of a tax-free savings account. There are uh, warrants and options. If you trade in, say, for example, puts and call, put in call strategies, you can put those mutual funds, segregated funds, Canada savings bonds, provincial savings bonds, or corporate bonds. You can put insured mortgages into a tax-free savings account and certain shares of small business corporations. And uh, there's some restrictions. I want to talk a little bit later about what are um, eligible or what are qualified and non-qualified investments. So there are occasions where you could put shares of a business inside your corporation as well. If you make a contribution of what's called a non-qualified investment or a prohibited investment, CRA takes this very seriously and you don't want to go there. There are ta additional taxes that apply and I will cover this off in more detail later, but it's it's significant and it, it's not a minor issue. So if you uh, have or you may have these types of investments into in your TFSA, you really need to pay attention to that because it can be very, very costly. So now you've got money in your TFSA, you've got it invested, you want to take money out. So how do withdrawals work? Generally speaking, you can take money out of your TFSA at any time. Uh, there's um, There are uh, no tax consequences. Uh, there are, I guess, some exceptions, which we'll cover later. But for the most part, the money comes out of the tax-free savings account, as the name implies, uh, tax-free. Important, if you receive any government benefits, such as old age security, uh, guaranteed income supplement, uh, employment insurance, uh, Canada child benefits, Canada workers benefit, or if you have the age, uh, the, uh, age amount that uh, some seniors will get, and uh, or a GST or HST tax credit, none of these benefits, none of these amounts will be affected by money that you take out of your tax-free savings account. So that's a real, almost like a rare bonus where you're not penalized uh, for that, that type of income because it doesn't count as, uh, as taxable income. I want to speak for a few minutes about uh, when a tax uh, a TFSA holder dies because it happens and there are some serious tax concerns or issues that you should be aware of to make sure that this process or the, the, the movement of the money from an estate uh, to an individual goes uh, you know, as smoothly as possible. There are uh, tax implications that basically come down to four uh, different criteria. Number, number one is the type of the beneficiary will affect how it's taxed. The type of the tax-free savings account itself actually matters. If the person dies and then there's income earned inside of that tax-free uh, account after the death, that may or may not be taxable depending on the circumstances and how long it takes from after the death until the money is distributed uh, will factor in as well. There are two types of beneficiaries. There's what's called the successor holder. And this is a special designation that is limited to a spouse or a common law partner in a relationship. The other more generic type uh, of uh, beneficiary is simply called the beneficiary. And this could be uh, a former spouse or a common law partner. It could be your children. It could be qualified uh, donors such as um, uh, charity groups, etc. The way that the money is distributed after death will be determined by the actual contract itself, the TFSA contract, uh, or a will. Uh, it can be directed by a will. And in certain um, jurisdictions, for example, in Quebec, there are restrictions around uh, naming a beneficiary uh, inside of a TFSA. And so uh, you have to be aware of the region of the country that you live in and how that might impact the distribution of assets from the plan once someone has passed away. I want to talk for a moment about the successor holder designation. And if you are married, if you are a spouse, or if you're in a common law relationship, I would say almost always, but certainly generally speaking, you want to be designated as a successor a holder, uh, not a beneficiary directly. When you become, or when you're named as a, as a successor holder, you essentially, when the person dies, that TFSA becomes yours immediately. There's no uh, transfer, there's no uh, tax, uh, there's no gap from when the person passes away until um, you, you, you know, the money goes into your name. Another factor is that as a successor, your room in your TFSA is not affected. So if a uh, successor holder is already maxed out on their tax-free savings account, they can inherit a, a, an entire new uh, tax-free savings account, fully maximized or even more, uh, without affecting their room. That's really important. 
Uh, you do need to have uh, a social insurance number to uh, be to receive that money. In most cases, you would already. If you're a non-resident, you can apply for a CRA individual tax number in order to re receive those funds if you don't already have one. Now, if there is excess funds or if there are excess funds in the tax-free account that you're inheriting, the tax penalties that that entails, and we're going to cover those off more later, applies to the deceased holder to the estate. It doesn't hold, uh, you know, up until the time of death. So you're not going to be penalized for excess tax implications that occurred before the person passed away. But when you when you receive the amount, it will be it, the amount that you receive will include that excess amount. Now, if you have room in your TFSA, not a problem. That amount just goes in there. But if that puts you into a an excess situation as well, you're going to have to take steps to remove that from the plan in order to avoid the penalty, which is you know one percent a month, which is uh, which is very stiff. Now, if you are a beneficiary who's not the survivor, not the spouse uh, of the person who passed away, you do receive the amount of the plan. Now, if you have uh, available room inside of your TFSA, you can make that contribution to your own TFSA. Um, if not, it just becomes uh, in money that you've inherited, but you don't have the special treatment of the tax-free savings account any longer. There are special rules that apply if you're a beneficiary, but you're a spouse. So in other words, if you're not named as a successor holder, but you're named as a beneficiary and you are a spouse, uh, special conditions apply. So first of all, you may designate all or a portion of a survivor payment as an exempt contribution to your own tax-free savings account, and this won't affect your own unused room. Uh, the amount uh, must be received during what's called the rollover period, and that begins when the tax uh, the TFSA holder dies and ends the end of the calendar year that follows the year of death. In this situation, you must designate it as an exempt contribution, and there's a form RC240 that you use uh, from the CRA. And then once that's done, you must send the form within 30 days after the contribution is made. It's important to note that the, the, the uh, total exempt uh, contributions can't exceed the fair market value as of the date of death. So when the person passed away, if their account value was X, that's the amount that you can contribute into your own tax-free savings account. Any growth uh, from that point on would not fall under this exempt rule. There are also specific rules that apply to non-residents. Let's cover those off very quickly right now. Number one, if you are a non-resident from Canada, you are still able to keep your tax-free savings account. A lot of confusion out there today, but you don't, you're not forced to liquidate your TFSA because you become non-resident uh, in status. However, you cannot contribute after you've moved. You can contribute up until the day that you become a non-resident, but once you become non-resident, you cannot contribute anymore to the plan. Also, no room accrues to the plan. One final comment on the non-resident situation is if you have a an, an excess amount that is in your tax-free savings account at, when you're a non-resident, you have to withdraw that or you'll be subject to a 1% penalty per month. Now that differs from being a resident. If you're a resident, you are taxed 1% of the value of the uh, over contribution. Whereas imagine you're over contributed by $6,000 uh, as a non-resident and you withdraw 5,900 of that, you will still continue to be taxed 1% on the full amount. Uh, you don't get credit for taking some of it out. You have to take all of it out in order to remove that uh, ongoing penalty. So very, very critical if you're in that circumstance that you address that as soon as possible. I wanna move on now to some common mistakes that are made with TFSAs and hopefully with this information I'm about to share with you, you can avoid these and, and, and really they are quite common. The first one we see all the time is when you transfer from tax-free savings account to tax-free savings account. That is a simple process. Any investment company out there will help you do that but you do need to make what's called a direct transfer from tax-free uh, savings account A to TFSA B. It's not that uncommon that someone might just say, I've got you know $5,000 over here at the Royal Bank and I wanna put it over at my account at the TD Bank where they might just sell it and take it out and make a new contribution to the, to the new bank. That doesn't cut it. What it does is it actually counts as a withdrawal from your plan and then it counts as a contribution to a new plan. Now, if you don't have enough room, if you don't have the available contribution room, that will actually put you into a uh, an over contribution room. If you have room, you can do it that way, but uh, the best way to do it is to just do the transfer directly so it doesn't count as either a withdrawal 
or a contribution. Another mistake I hear all the time is this blanket advice, never hold a US stock in your tax-free savings account. You are gonna hear that from all kinds of different sources. I just vehemently disagree with that. The, the concept of the advice is that if you hold a US stock inside of your tax-free savings account and it pays you a dividend, then there's a withholding tax of 15% that applies to that US dividend. And that in and of itself is, is causing people to say, never do it. Imagine if your only investment is a tax-free savings account and you're building up your wealth and your portfolio by, having, uh, by, by using that account, which is a good strategy. Are you telling me that you should only ever put Canadian investments inside of a tax-free savings account? Um, I, I would you know, strongly argue against that. If you have a tax-free savings account and a, an RRSP, and they're you know, both forming part of your plan and you have to differentiate between the two, well, then you could make an argument that says, hold your US companies inside of your RRSP and hold your Canadian companies inside of your TFSA. But there's so much more to, that goes into building and managing an investment portfolio than, than just that. It's really not that simple. Uh, you need to be aware of the 15% withholding tax like you need to be aware of any other type of tax. But if you are making uh, portfolio investment decisions based solely on that one factor, uh, you're not doing it right. So make sure that you have a bigger picture, make sure you invest first, and then you um, determine the best placement of those assets depending on your entire tax situation, not just uh, you know one sliver of, of things that you need to consider. Another mistake that people make a lot is uh, recontributing. You withdraw in one year and you recontribute back in the same year. There is a provision in a tax-free savings account that if you take money out, that uh, the room, the, the amount that you took out is added to your room for the following year. But if you're already maxed out in your TFSA and you take out, say, $5,000 in January, and if you put that $5,000 back in you know, at any point during the year, and you don't have that room available, that will put you into an over uh, an excess contribution scenario where you're gonna be paying that uh, that tax. So um, really important, a simple mistake to make, but um, you, you don't wanna do that. Another um, error that people make, uh, it's it's possible, it's quite, it's quite okay to have more than one TFSA. You can have as many TFSAs as you want. However, it's easy to lose track of what you've contributed to each plan. So I've seen where uh, you have a, you know maybe three different banks and, and, and three different TFSAs, and if you've got maybe an automatic contribution going into one and you're you you know, you're putting money ad hoc into another, you just have to be really sure that you don't over contribute uh, because you're you know, losing track uh, of where you're, putting, uh, where you're putting your contributions. Another big one is, and this goes right back to 2009 when the, when the TFSAs were first uh, introduced, is people just throw their entire risk profile, their investment strategies out the window when it comes to TFSAs. And I remember back in the day where there, there's two conflicting uh, points of view. One is, well, gee, a tax-free savings account, if you, you, know, get a, you invest in the, and the company goes up 1,000%, you can sell that without paying any tax. And that's perfectly true. If you're a person who is inclined to buy high risk speculative investments, you can make an argument for that. Most people aren't. So th the fact that you would say, gee, if I, if I nail this, uh, I can make a whole bunch of money without uh, paying tax on it. If that's the determining factor and you're normally a conservative investor, well, that's not a very good strategy because there's also a flip side to that. If that investment goes to zero or you lose a lot of money on it, you also, um, you know, you, you lose that. You don't get the benefit of a uh, an offsetting tax deduction. The uh, Obviously, the risk versus reward. If you're a conservative investor and all of a sudden you're buying, you know, shares of some speculative penny stock inside of your TFSA, you're running the risk of, of losing that money, which may be way outside of your comfort zone. Um, always, uh, again, look at it from a portfolio perspective and you don't just become more conservative or more, uh, aggressive overall because of the fact that you have your money inside of a TFSA account. Although again, I, I've heard that for the last 13 years now um, that, that you've been able to contribute to a tax-free savings account, I've seen that strategy. Another mistake is, uh, we talked about this earlier, calculating uh, how much money you have available in your tax-free savings or contribution room rather, is don't rely solely on CRA. I mentioned that early in the early months of each year, it takes a while for them to update their records. So if you're anxious to make a tax-free savings uh, contribution on say in January of, the, of, of any given year, good chance when you go to CRA's website and look at the amount that you can put in there, it's probably gonna be wrong. So use that as a resource. 
uh, you know, combine it with your own math, use the spreadsheets uh, that we've prepared uh, if you want to use that as a tool. But in order to avoid penalties, you always want to make sure that you are uh, aware of what your contribution room is uh, before you put yourself into a dicey situation. I want to talk now about a few simple strategies that you can use to make, uh, make the most of your tax-free savings account, starting with income splitting. In uh, most, in many accounts, you can't just give, in many circumstances, you can't just give your spouse money, believe it or not. You can't give your spouse money to invest without having that attribute back to you. A tax-free savings account is uh, an exemption to that. You can actually give your spouse money to uh, invest in a tax-free savings account. So if you have two people and one has little or no income, you can take that uh, annual amount or a lump sum amount, give it to them. They can contribute that to their tax-free savings account. And as a family, you're going to end up saving, uh, you know, quite a bit of, you, you potentially could save quite a bit of money over the years. So that's something that you need to be aware of and, um, and should use if it works to your advantage. Another advantage, another strategy is if you know early in a calendar year, you're going to be taking money out of your TFSA for whatever purpose, it may make sense to take it out later in the year prior. So in 2022, you know, we're getting close to the end of 2021. If you know in January 2022 that you're going to be taking money out of an RSP, uh, it might be a good idea to take uh, money out in December of this year. That way you get that room back in 2022. So if you take out, say, $10,000 in January next year, well, you won't get that $10,000 contribution room available till 2023. Whereas if you take it out in December, even December 31st, of this year, you'll have that room available if you have the cash flow available to put it back in um, in 2022, early in the year. Another strategy you might use is helping your children. A lot of adults help their children, whether it's you know for uh, schooling, whether it's for you know helping with housing, that type of thing. Um, you can give money or gift money in this case to a child as long as it's an adult child. You you can freely give gift them money. Um, they will, from that point on, be responsible for the taxes on that money. But uh, if they put that into their own tax-free savings account, uh, you're going to be able to help them out uh, rather than just taking money that you've paid tax on and, and uh, give it to them that way there. A question that comes around all the time is, should I put money in my tax-free savings account or my RRSP? Um, there is no silver as there's no silver bullet. There's no universal answer to this. It depends on so many factors. But a few things to consider uh, might help you if that's a decision that you're grappling with right now. First of all, uh, it depends a lot on your income level. So let's look at what income level might dictate a decision one way or the other. First of all, if you have a low income, if you have a low income. RRSPs may be of little value. Now, it could be you just, you just have low income forever, or it could be you're in a period of time right now where you know maybe you're on maternity leave, or maybe you've taken some time off work, or uh, you know just your income in 2021, for example, will be lower than it normally would be. In this case, the the decision skews more towards putting money into the tax-free savings account. Because you're getting little bang for the buck in the RSP in any event, you can put the money into your tax-free savings account. It's going to get the benefit of growing tax-free. If at some point in the future, let's say you go back and your and your um, your uh, income is higher at some point, well, you can just take the money out of your tax-free savings account or transfer it into your RRSP at that point. Get benefit for the contribution, and um, you know you're you're not losing the ability to put it into your RRSP at some point. So I, I would say if you have low income. The decision skews more towards putting money into a tax-free savings account. Middle income, gee, somewhere in the middle, and and this is a you know there's a it it uh, it always comes down to a number of different factors. But if uh, the a scenario I just sort of explained is if you expect that your middle income now, but your income is going to be rising at some point or going lower at some point. Um, you might split the difference. You might put the money, some into the RSP, some into your uh, tax-free savings account. Uh, you're getting, getting some benefit from the tax deduction. Um, however, if it's uh, a lower benefit, you know, just you can split the money or very commonly what people do, and I'll talk about this with high income earners, is make a contribution to your RRSP, take the tax refund and put that into your TFSA. You could also use uh, the TFSA as an emergency fund if that's something that you feel would, you know, everybody should have an emergency fund. And if your tax-free savings account is your emergency vehicle, then that's an option you have to use that uh, for that purpose as well. If you're a high income earner, now I would say in this case, in many cases, the decision skews more towards uh, putting money into your tax or into your RRSP. Uh, you're going to get a bigger bang for the buck, a bigger tax deduction, save taxes today. Yes, at some point down the road, you are going to have to take that money out. You will be liable for taxes then. But this may be a classic example of putting money in, 
getting it at a you know getting a good deduction, taking that tax uh, deduction and putting it into your tax free savings account. Um, that's uh, a reasonable, uh, I would say, compromise because you know there's not really always just it's not one or the other. Uh, in, in this scenario, that's something you probably should uh, should be considering. Lastly, here I'm going to talk about some misconceptions and some myths and and, and misunderstandings. Uh, I may have touched on some of them earlier, but I just want to make sure that these are, are sort of solid in your head if you're going to go out and to have uh, TFSAs. First of all, remember, tax-free savings account is an account. It is not an investment. And even today, I hear people say things like, oh, yeah, I have an investment. I have a tax-free savings account or I have a TFSA. Well, what is it invested in? It's in a TFSA without any idea of what the actual investment choices uh, are in. This goes right back to 2009 when it was marketed that a TFSA is an investment. It's not Get that out of your head. Make sure that money inside of that plan is managed properly. Another misconception you hear a lot is if you take room, uh, if you take money out of your TFSA, you don't get it back. I see this all the time. There's confusion out there. If you, uh, as an example, let's assume you've maximized your seventy-five thousand that you're able, to, or seventy-five thousand five hundred that you're able to put in if you're eighteen or older as of two thousand nine. That money has now grown to ten thousand dollars. Well. If you take that full, or sorry, it's grown to $100,000. You can now, if you take that full $100,000 out and put it, uh, you know, take it out of the TFSA in 2021, you can put that $100,000 back in in 2022. A lot of people will argue, no, you can't. You can only put the, the limit or the contribution amount. Uh, that's not the case. You can put the entire amount that you withdrew, growth included, back into your TFSA the following year. A lot of uh, misconception out there, misunderstanding about uh, what are called over or OTC, over-the-counter uh, traded stocks. Uh, a lot of foreign countries have uh, what are called ADRs or uh, American Depository Receipts that trade on U.S. stock exchanges, but they trade on what's called the over-the-counter uh, exchange. And there's a lot of misconception that you cannot hold those inside of your RRR, your tax-free savings account. You can, as long as this security is traded on a designated stock exchange, and there are many of them around the world, you can in fact hold those, even if they're trading over-the-counter in the United States, you can put those inside of your TFSA. A designated stock exchange is defined as a stock exchange or part of a stock exchange for which a designation by the Minister of Finance under Section 262 is in effect. I'm scrolling a list for these companies right now. So if you see a company that trades on one of these exchanges, it will be eligible for tax-free savings accounts as well. So when you hear online that you can't, I hope this clears uh, that up. Another TFSA related issue that we hear constantly is uh, things like, well, you can't place a whole bunch of trades inside uh, of your account or the CRA is gonna come after you. Uh, you can't day trade inside your TFSA. And, and this has caused a lot of confusion. The issue isn't whether you are placing frequent trades inside your TFSA. The issue is more related to, are you carrying on a business? There are six major factors that, th that the courts ultimately would decide if you are carrying on a business inside of your uh, tax-free savings account. I'm going to list those off here. Number one, what is the duration of the holding? If you're buying and holding for minutes or hours or even a few days at a time, uh, that will be one of the factors that uh, the courts determine. And this is where probably the day trading issue uh, is sort of most prominent. The volume of trading that you have. Are you constantly trading? Are there, are there trades uh, in, in addition to the duration, but you're, you're trading a lot? The time that you spend trading. In other words, if your day is spent trading, it could be interpreted that you are actually running a business here and not just investing. The types of investments that you buy matter, and it comes down to are you buying uh, penny stocks, are you buying speculative investments and flipping here and there, whether you're making money or not, um, or are you buying you know, long-term, if you're buying GICs or you're buying long-term uh, blue chip type companies, that is one of, the, uh, one of the factors that will be determined as to whether you uh, are gonna have your the, the tax-free nature of the account uh, taken away. Your experience in the, uh, in, the, in the investment world matters as well. If you are a veteran investment advisor and your activity inside of your account is you know, multiple times a day or a week you're making trades, that will factor in. And lastly, uh, they, what they call purchase intent. So when you make the purchase of a company, um, you know, are, are, are you, uh, what's the intent of it? Are you intending to hold it for long term and then maybe something happened and you changed your mind? But if there's a pattern of constantly buying with the intent of, of doing it on a short term basis, you're not going to get benefit of the tax-free nature of the tax-free savings account. 
people will say all the time, and it's true, if you go to CRA, it doesn't spell out what this, uh, what the limits are. These factors all have to come in and probably one of them in isolation doesn't make a tax-free savings account ineligible for those benefits. But when you look at a combination of them, uh, that's where ultimately CRA may deny uh, your tax deductibility. And if you go to court, the courts are going to use those factors to determine whether in fact uh, you do enjoy uh, the TFSA benefits or not. The last thing I'm going to address today is this myth that tax-free savings account are always tax-free. Usually they are but not always. And I'll go through some circumstances where they're not. First of all, and I may have touched on some of these earlier, but if you have an extra amount, if you've over contributed to your tax-free savings account, you will pay a tax penalty on that. And that penalty is significant. It's 1% of the, the highest value per month. So it's, it's essentially 12% a year. And I mean, that's a huge, I mean, some credit cards are probably uh, charging less interest than that. So this is not interest per se, it's a tax penalty, but you have to make some pretty good returns uh, on that extra contribution to make, you know, to make up for those losses. There's also what are called prohibited investments. In general, prohibited investments are investments where the account holder has a close relationship with, uh, with the company that's being owned inside. Uh, the the sort of the threshold, or there's a couple of different criteria that, that need to be factored in once. One is if the account holder owns 10% or controls 10% or more of the company, uh, that would be a factor. And also if they, uh, de if they don't deal with the company at arm's length. So um, in a case like this, you're not eligible to hold that investment inside of your tax-free savings account. There are severe penalties if you do this. I'll cover those off in just a moment. Along the same lines, there's also investments that are called non-qualified investments. And an example would be a company that does that is not trade on a uh, a stock exchange. And so, if you end up with a with a with a non-qualified investment, the penalties are going to be the same as well. They're going to they're actually very similar between the the prohibited and the non-qualified. Let me go through what those uh, penalties are right now. First of all, you're going to pay a 50% tax on the fair market value of the property. Uh, at the acquisition of it or when it became non-qualified or prohibited. So there are occasions where you may own something that becomes a non-qualified asset. You're going to pay a 50% tax on the fair market value of that property. Also, you will pay a 100% tax on any income or capital gains that you derive from that investment. So if you are aware of something that might be prohibited or non-qualified in your, in your tax-free savings account, make sure you address those um, they are very serious. Now, there are some circumstances where you may be eligible for a refund on part of that. For example, if you disposed of or, or if the investment stopped being a prohibited or non-qualified investment before the end of the calendar year after which the tax arose, you may apply for some relief from CRA on that. Now, this does not apply if you knew or you should have known that the investment was prohibited. There's occasions where uh, this just crops up, you've never heard of it, and uh, and so the, the CRA gives you some leeway there. But if you knew this was prohibited and there's evidence of that, they're gonna deny a refund on that. Also note that the 100% tax that applies to the capital gains and the income, uh, that's not gonna be refunded under uh, any circumstances that, that I'm aware of. We've covered a lot of information today regarding the tax-free savings accounts. And as I said at the, uh, at the introduction, they're a very valuable tool. They're a misunderstood tool. Uh, not everything related to tax-free savings account is straightforward, and there are, you know, the, the, the rules change from time to time as well. So when I put this video together, I considered should I break it into smaller chunks, which I think is more YouTube friendly. But I wanted to build a resource that people can go to um, that sort of covers off pretty much all of the major questions that people would be uh, would be um, interested in. And you, you know, there, there'll be bookmarks in the video, so you can go back and if there's a, a refresher you want on any particular topic, you'll be able to go back and review that. So I am gonna wrap up the video today. I'm gonna remind everybody that we do have our Investment Academy, which will be in the first link below. And um, that academy is growing uh, literally every month. We're adding new resources. And if it's something you've been thinking about or something you want more information on, just click that link and, um, and uh, you know, ha have a browse through the website there. Uh, this has been a long video. I'm going to thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to watch. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.